All right. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the latest episode of Keeping It Simple with Simplify. So today's theme is intergenerational conflict, where we're going to have a wide ranging conversation about the different opportunities and risks that are out there for different generations of investors. And today we're, we're absolutely delighted to have two all-star first round draft pick Gen Zers in the form of Kyla Scanlon, who has found an amazing audience by taking complex, usually boring topics and making them interesting and digestible um, through her preferred mediums of TikTok, Twitter, YouTube, and then also does some really wonderful longer form with really cool visuals on Substack um, in the written format. And then essentially what she's done is taken something pretty boring and, and, and made it interesting and accessible for, for her age cohort. And then kind of even further down the age segment off of his first week of university at University of Toronto, which unfortunately was remote, thanks to uh, Mr. Trudeau. But uh, Sri Prakash, who is the host and um, founder of Market Champions, for those of you who don't know who Sri's story, he started this podcast when he was 14 years old and has had some of the amazing thinkers in, in, the, in investing on the podcast. And then of course, we have our regular host, Harley Bassman, AKA the Convexity Maven, who may represent the boomer generation, but doesn't have to like it. Uh, we know that he looks wonderful. We know his chains are awesome. So um, thank you for the comments in advance. And then Mike Green, AKA Professor Plum, who is literally calling in from his mom's house right now. <laughs> um, he claims he's Generation X and has the concert t-shirts and cargo pants to prove it. But a couple of housekeeping items before we kick off, there is a Q&A button right down at the bottom of the screen. Click that, we will see it in real time. We're gonna try and answer questions as we go. Um, the chat button, if you just wanna make a comment and, 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 and make fun of us, you can use that as well. But uh, Q&A is the way to go. We're going to try and answer these in real time. If there's time at the end, we'll have a devoted session for Q&A. But this conversation is meant to be fun. It's meant to be entertaining. It's meant to be informative. It is not meant to be uh, investment advice. So please don't <laughs> take it as such. So with that, we're going to start off with a poll. So Jimmy, if you would put up our first poll, we want to read the room and see you know, what generation does everyone in here belong to? All right, looks like we're having some issues with the poll. Um, Jimmy, do you have it? All right, there we go. All right, so for our intergenerational conflict, choose your team. What generation are you in? Do, you, do we have anyone here from the greatest generation? It'd be interesting to see. And if you are generation alpha, which is born after 2012, if you select that, you're going to be dumped off the call because we want people to be able to use colorful language that your parents will frown upon. So if you are Generation Alpha, good on you for being on the call, but have a great afternoon. So with that, Jimmy, will you please show us the results? All right. Wow. Interesting. So we've got a couple people from the silent generation mostly dominated by boomers, Gen X, and millennials. Kyla and Shri, you guys have disappointed us greatly with your reach into Gen Z, but we still have a broad enough reach here across generations to have an interesting conversation. So with that, Mike, why don't you take it and uh, let's discuss. So part of, part of the dynamic, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just looking at the uh, question in chat. Um, is Mike sitting in the house Hitchcock used to film Psycho? No, I am not sitting. <laughs> I'm not sitting in the house that Hitchcock used to film Psycho, but I am truly at my mother's apartment. So th this was one of these conversations that, you know, Harley and I both have this all the time. We talk all the time about what's happening to the younger generation. We have kids that are both in Generation Z and are approaching maturity and approaching the point where they're asking us, what do we do to invest We've got this incredible opportunity with Kyla and Sri to kind of ask the question, like, how does the younger generation actually think about the world of investing? What are you looking for? What types of products are people investing in other than Bitcoin? Although, obviously, I want to hear about the crypto investments. And most importantly, get a sense for how you guys think about the dynamic between the generations. Because there's this, you know, this classic phrase that's emerged from, in particular, the Gen Z's 
to a little, little bit less extent, the millennials of the OK Boomer type framework, right? So given that, I'd love to hear from you guys, what in the world are you doing on an investment podcast and, and how are you thinking about your personal investments at this stage? Why don't we start with Kyla? Yeah, yeah. Um, so what am I doing on an investment podcast? So I was kindly invited. <laughs> so thanks for having me on. Um, I guess like for me and like most of my audience who tends to be in like that 20 to 27 ish age frame. So like a little bit like the zillennial group, um, most of them are still trying to figure out like what investing is. Like they have a general idea of what a stock is, but they don't really know like what to build a portfolio on. Like portfolio allocation is just something that's like a little bit not taught in school. So that's what I like make my content about. But for me personally, like I'm super into crypto. I think it's really interesting. I worry about the regulatory framework around it. Um, I really like tech. So I'm invested in like a lot of fintech companies and I really like waste management companies. So I like try to have a diversified portfolio where I'm like betting on the future per se. But then I also have these like recessionary companies where if things go south, like, you know, we're still going to have trash. So that's how I think about my personal portfolio design so 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 you're diversifying but you're buying individual stocks do you have a 401k i do yeah yeah but in that i'm a target date person target date i know don't don't come for me (laughs) (laughs) um but i am a target date person in the 401k and then my personal account is where i like focus my energy on which i know is like that's a touchy topic so it, it, it's it, it's it's actually not touchy. I mean, for me, it's actually really interesting. And I, I wish that we had done a poll to hit exactly the millennials and Gen Zs in the audience and ask them the question, you know, do you have a 401k? How are you investing, et cetera? Because as I've shared publicly with people, I mean, the target date fund answer to the 401k may have been the only question, the only options that were available to you unless you sought out a self-directed, right? Which mm-hmm. is hard to do. Shri, same question to you, you know, are, are you are you betraying the principles under which I've raised you? And uh, are, are you investing in uh, in in passive indexes and, and target date funds, or what? Are, what are you doing these days? So uh, anecdotally speaking, um, at least my friends uh, as a whole, they've gotten more into stuff like number one crypto and number two trading options, and a lot of it is uh, social platforms that. We, we saw the rise of meme stocks earlier this year. And with that, I also saw a rise in the number of uh, my friends asking me, you know, what stock they should be buying. And uh, obviously I didn't give them an answer to that. But um, but but what you see is, you know, as Kyla mentioned, a lot of people have started getting more into crypto, have started getting more into options and so on. And at least personally speaking, I'm similar to Kyla in a way because I like to pick stocks as well. And uh, we've had this discussion before, but I'm to an extent still a value investor. Still have some faith in <laughs> in Benjamin Graham and Warren Buffett. Uh, but um, but you know, you know, but at least thinking about portfolio construction, you know, I spend a lot of time, you know, reading annual reports, going through financial statements, looking at you know earnings transcripts, so on, and uh, and yeah, so that's and you know, uh, I've joked around that I'm really just a boomer in a zoomer's body, but. <laughs> But yeah, that's, 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 that's significantly better than the alternative. But it's um, <laughs> the when, when you when you when you think about you know being a value investor and you read annual reports, et cetera, Do you build a DCF discounted cash flow model? Yes, uh, uh, I have a bit trade you, Michael. But yes, <laughs> no, that's a, a, that that actually is incredibly important if you're going to do a single stock. Right. When you do a discounted cash flow, where are you getting your forecast from? So typically it comes from either my analysis or usually what I do with DCFs is, uh, I think it was Warren Buffett who said this in the essays of Warren Buffett. And he talked about using sort of a very, very conservative estimate for growth and a slightly higher than normal discount rate to ensure that, you know, you're sort of guaranteed getting a margin of safety as, you know, as the value investor crowd calls it. And so that's sort of what I think of, um, when, 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 like purchasing the stocks to ensure that, you know, let's say, you know, things just go absolutely you know, disastrous. Do I still have a margin of safety in that type of situation? And, you know, if the answer is yes, and, you know, and there's still, you know, a sort of catalyst and, you know, the base case is still higher than that, you know, that's, that tends to usually be some sort of a worthy investment. Now, when you think about doing something like a discounted cash flow analysis and you're using a conservative growth assumption, like how, how can you find something in this market that is you don't <laughs> cheap? You don't, right? Yeah, so, you don't. 
So there's nothing to buy when you approach it from the value investor framework. At least at the you, moment, not really. Um, unless... which, which leaves you to buy crypto is what you're telling me. <laughs> crypto and options. Okay. Ky- Kyla, do you model the companies that you invest in? Oh, uh, look at that uh, smile. I used to. I mean, that used to be like part of my job when I was at, yep. at, at my old company. Like I was, I built models. Um, and so, but now I'm just like, do I like the company? Do I think it'll do okay in 10 years? Sure. So yeah, I, I, I've strayed from the valuation framework. I think it's like really important still, but for me, like, I just don't do it. I used to like really, really do it. Like I used to build all sorts of models, did whack, like everything, but um, yeah, not anymore. Yeah. Fascinating. I mean, that, that, it, it could be that you guys are just that much faster than I am in the development path, right? Because I spent probably 15 years as a single stock picker trying to, you know, really understand the companies, et cetera, before I realized that, you know, that's just not working right now. Um, so when you think about that dynamic, when you think about, you know, what does it look like in 10 years? Is that just a function of your time horizon? So you buy them and you, you have no interest in trading them effectively for 10 years? No, or do you actively no. trade? Um, I used to actively trade. So I traded options like all throughout college and I just like time was not my friend, you know, over the past couple of years, so I didn't have time to trade as much as I wanted to. So I still like sell covered calls against my like core positions, but that's the only options trading that I do. So the main thing is like, I just want to have a portfolio that reflects my beliefs. And then I have some companies that I'm just like, I don't like Facebook. Like, I'm not like, oh yeah, it's like Zuckerberg's the best guy ever. <laughs> like, I don't, you know, that's not how I really feel about the company, but I do think they're going to do really well. And this is not investment advice, but um, I do hold them, but I'm not like their biggest fan too. So, so, so that's interesting. And, and now is your interest in Facebook a function of your participation in Facebook itself? Or do you have a Facebook account? No, I haven't logged on to Facebook uh, in like maybe three years. Yeah. That's pretty much like me too. I mean, it's, <laughs> I, I, I always find it fascinating that people talk about how Facebook is the future, but it's more nobody than I just, know. It's more yeah. than the social. It's more than the social. So like Oculus, um, I do think that they're going to be like first movers in sort of the metaverse space. Um, they have WhatsApp, they have Geo, like they have a lot more stuff outside of like Facebook, the Facebook. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Harley, when you think about your kids and their investment, how, where would they fit in in the spectrum that we've laid out here, which is basically we like to do valuation analysis, but in the absence of the opportunity to really do it, we're just going to go buy crypto. Uh, well, I, I would say I like Kyla's uh, pairs trade of uh, trash currencies and trash companies. So that kind of work. <laughs> um, I, I, in my kids, did they invest? But I, I'd say it's, a, it's really, you know, longer term horizon. They'll pick a few names, but I'm, I'm sure they also own just, you know, SPY and um, some maybe, you know, I've advised them to buy like you know, a mid dated uh, high grade uh, fund to diversify. Um, but, you know, other than that, I, mean, I, I think it's very challenging to go and um, pick single names unless that's your profession. I mean, I rarely pick single, na- single names and I mean, I'm kind of a professional. I think it's very challenging to do that. Um, but, but I push back on, on three, on one thing, but if you really go look at the at the SPUs, uh, SP 500, and uh, pull out the uh, top seven names, really hasn't budged all that much in the last number of years. Um, so uh, the value, you know, bang dynamic has widened dramatically. Um, and yeah. of course, you know, doing a PE ratio on companies with negative earnings and everything, and the way that the weightings are done make it challenging. But I, I think there's a lot of stuff out there that actually is a reasonable value oriented that's viable, but it's just boring. I mean, you want, I mean, I, I, I'm not gonna mention names, I mean, you're get in trouble for that, but I mean, anything in the oil sector, we're not going out of, uh, out of, out of, out of oil anytime soon, despite, you know, uh, the politics of it. And um, these companies kick, you know, have cash flow that covers a, a five, six percent yield. That's a bad idea in a, in a zero percent environment. I don't think so. So, I mean, it's just, it's the problem is the value stocks are pretty boring uh, and no one wants to buy them. Well, so Kyla referred to the, 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 dynamic of having a barbell portfolio with the, uh, you know, Republic services or the trash companies. I'm guessing that's what you were referring to waste management, et cetera. Um, when you, you know, it's, it's an interesting observation, Harley, when you think about stripping out the top names or the most expensive or the largest names out of the S and P 500 and presenting it in that fashion, you know, while the valuation for the index itself looks relatively cheap on that framework, even the energy companies themselves are really not that cheap. Right, they're they're it's it, it's interesting. Well, bad for a cyclical, a cyclical capital intensive business. I try to call oil a cyclical. I mean, per se, 
Um, but nonetheless, I mean, even very cyclical. I mean, I mean, I mean auto companies are cyclical, but um, oil companies are really not at peak earnings right now. And you have PE of a dozen, like, that's bad in a 0% world, 1% world. I mean, it really begs the question, the three is like, if you do a DCF, what number do you use for, 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 your, for your rate? I mean, that's why the FANG stocks are all trading where they are, is because they're effectively 70 year duration bonds. Um, which is which is the whole which is the risk of the whole world. The rates actually went up even to where they were a year and a half ago. Um, the price of the thing could not get wiped out, but you know, worth less, not worthless, worth less. Um, it makes a big deal when you go and take that discount rate from uh, two to three. So, thinking about what Harley is saying, and actually, there's an interesting question that's been been raised in the Q and A, right? Which is, how does your generation, and and candidly, my generation, or, and Harley to a certain extent, you as well, like, if we were to return, if we were actually to get higher rates, if we were to get inflation, would that change the way that you invest? Would you move well, away from? We break that into two pieces because I'm not going to stipulate that inflation and higher rates go together. I think it's two different you, concepts. You, you, you absolutely schooled Bill Flugenstein and, and Grant Williams on exactly that topic. And, and I, I think that's actually a really important one. I always point out to people that when inflation was 4 million percent in Zimbabwe, the interest rate was nine, right? So 9%. So there doesn't have to be a link in any way, shape or form. But there is this interesting question, which is if we were to get inflation, would you change the way that you invest? If you were to get higher interest rates, would it change anything in terms of what you're describing? Let's start with Kyla. I, I think that's like tough because I mean, like I, I've never seen high interest rates. So I think to that question, like I don't even know what that would look like. So yeah, I would probably have to change the way that I would invest, but there would be a learning curve to that. Like I, I can't even like fathom, like my parents all the time, they're like, oh, you don't know what it was like. And like we had yeah, our student loan debt was crazy. Um, and it's just like, uh, there's like not, you know, a former knowledge base on that. So I'd have to learn how, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'd imagine it changes the way everybody invests. Like you, it would just change how companies are valued too. Like it, everything would have to change, I, I'd imagine, right? I, I think it would have a big impact. I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting question that, that you actually answered in, in the way that I would kind of hope, which is, man, I've just never seen it before. I, I'd point out, by the way, that when you think about high interest rates, I mean, with the exception of a very, very you know, brief period in the, in the 1980s, the high interest rates were a feature even when I bought my first house in 1999, I paid seven and seven eighths for my mortgage. Right, which roughly the same level you would have paid had you gone back to 1990 or if you'd gone to 1985. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I do think that it is kind of one of these things that is it's shocking to me that you've never encountered it in any way, shape, or form. Uh, it's it's interesting. Would you buy bonds if you could get eight percent on a ten year? That's the right question, Mike. Is not our our companies worth less with rates at five or six, but all of a sudden. Would you allocate money to bonds instead? Because right now, buying bonds is 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 yeah. uh, it's a storage facility uh, for, for for money. It doesn't pay any interest. Yeah. Would Would you buy bonds at five percent interest, Kyla? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to have allocation to that. But like right now, it's just not appetizing. It's boring, you know. And there's just no reason to park your money there. I, I, yeah. I loved I loved the vocal fry. Boring. Boring. Bonds oh, are really? boring. Yeah, oh, yeah, you did it. Totally. Did I? Oh, that's the worst. Okay. I'll have to practice not to do that. That's my career. That's okay. No, right. somebody commented that the other day and I was like, oh, no. No, I don't do vocal fry. All right. Shri, really? give us your best vocal fry about bonds. Tell me. Come on, man. It's boring. <laughs> <laughs> now, if if you were to, it, let's, let's, let's play this game. So... 10 year moves to 5%. Equities shockingly are unchanged because everyone has forgotten that as bonds, you know, uh, rise in interest rate, that there's going to have to be far more of them issued as the federal government is paying. Therefore, if I think about a balanced fund exposure, it's going to have to have even more equities. So everyone's going to be really surprised that like 2000, we've got really high valuation in equities. What are you going to do at 5%? Are you going to buy equities? Are you going to buy a 10-year bond that guarantees you 5%? Are you going to buy crypto? So uh, um, 
So what actually is so what actually happened in the 1970s? And as we've discussed, it's sort of the biggest driver then was demographics, and they had a lot of other things, you know, the energy crisis, food crisis, etc. But, um, but you know, what I would argue is that at least as long as inflation lasts, you know, you should sort of be, I guess, long commodities as well. And uh, as well, if you see, if you if you sort of look at the situation and you, you can make a case for inflation starting to decline. You know, that's sort of when you would want to go long bonds because, mm-hmm. you know, if rates went up throughout the 1970s, then let's say, you know, buying bonds in, say, 1975 and, you know, rates rising after uh, and yields rising after that uh, would mean that bond prices would fall and that wouldn't be a good investment, would it? <laughs> so, well, uh, it's, it, it's interesting though, because, you know, Kyla's target date fund, right? So let's, let's play that through for a second. So Kyla's target date fund would be receiving cash inflows from bonds that are now paying higher interest rates. But at the same time, the, ri- the rising level of interest rates would mean that the bonds are underperforming in price terms. And perversely, her target date fund is going to be buying bonds on a continuous basis, effectively. Right. I mean, it's, it, it, you know, it's, so it's, it's one of these right. interesting things where when we think about the dynamic of systematic investing and a balanced portfolio that, that is trying to maintain a fixed allocation, that's going to lead to all sorts of interesting behavior that we may never have never seen before. There's an interesting question here. You brought up commodities, Shri. Have, Kyla, have you ever bought a commodity? Not, not even like, you know, generic laundry detergent. I'm joking. That's uh, oh, I think no. I bought GLD, the ETF, but I've never <laughs> bought like, yeah. So no, you no. have bought a commodity. You bought GLD, the ETF. ETF, yeah. Okay. Shri, have you ever bought a commodity? I've, uh, I've uh, attempted trading them uh, with a decent amount of success, but it's only been a few times now. That, that was a very humble brag there. So what, <laughs> what commodities have you traded? So one was... Uh, one was uh, buying oil when I think it was a few weeks back, you know, it just collapsed 8% on a Monday. And uh, the very next day, there was sort of a technical signal that signal that would go higher. And I decided to hop on it and it did go higher and it was nice. <laughs> and uh, I've, try, I've tried playing gold short before uh, and uh, it's limited. It, it resulted in sort of a really limited loss, but uh, so that's that's overall what I've really done in commodities. So you know, I'm not the commodity guy. I'm not a William Quaker by any means. So <laughs> you're not who? I'm sorry. I'm not a William Quaker. Uh, I think that was he was a he was a commodity legend. Um, Got it. Back in the day, yeah. Wow. Well, see, this is this is where I told you everyone I was going to get schooled. Okay. <laughs> um, would you maintain an allocation to commodities going forward? Do you think there's an inflationary environment, or are you worried about that? Me? Yeah. Uh, no, uh, I, I, I personally don't think we're going to see inflation over, say, you know, the next few years. Uh, I'm, I'm personally in the transitory camp. And uh, I think, I think, you know, uh, we've, we've sort of talked about this. Uh, I've, I, I made a thread on Twitter as well. And you did a KIS on this uh, last, last month. Uh, but I think that the main argument is that, you know, inflation is sort of the rate of change in prices and not the price level itself. So even if the price level remains elevated, you would have to see a, you know, the fancy word here would be a continued shift to the right in aggregate demand to see, you know, prices continue to rise. And uh, if that doesn't happen, and I, at least personally, I don't think it's going to happen, but uh, if that doesn't happen, you know, the rate of change will start to come down and the rate of change is, or is what we typically call inflation. So uh, at least personally, I wouldn't own any commodities, at least as of right now, excepting uranium. Uh, I find uranium to be interesting based on, well, based on whatever research I've done. And uh, yeah. Oh, hold on one second. Is your mother getting you? Oh, mom wants him. Yeah, no, mom's bringing over the meatloaf. Um, <laughs> Mike, why don't we focus on, on the future for a second over here? I'm yeah. curious what, 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 what these two think about the, 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 the path going forward. Because I, I would say that you know, the, the, the boomers have been like locusts um, eating everything in their path. And, and, and our politics and our economy has all been revolving around the boomer, which is effectively the pig and the python in this country. Um, and now that we're, the, we're reaching our retirement age, we've adjusted our politics to basically direct massive government support, Social Security, Medicare, at the expense of education, research, uh, forests, ecology, all those other kinds of things, you know, and, and the prices for what you know, millennials or Gen Z or Gen X, whatever it is, but what they're paying have, have gone, housing prices have advanced much more than wages have in the last 20 years. I'm curious how, how you two think about the, the outlook going forward. Uh, are you optimistic, pessimistic? 
um, about things. Um, I can I can go first, and I actually have like a little bit of a follow up to Shri. So like you were talking a little bit about like demand pull inflation, but there's also cost push inflation, and I think that's Great, yeah. what I'm a little bit more worried about, especially like you're Great, seeing yeah. it show up in semiconductors. Like like what's going to happen with that? And if like if we have a massive semiconductor shortage, which is like increasingly becoming a problem, I think um, that you're going to see sort of inflation across the board. Um, and to the point of the future, like, I think there's just been a lot of like can kicking down the road, like, oh, well, we'll fix the climate, like when we fix the climate, like, we'll like worry about, you know, getting people into houses when we get into houses, we'll worry about like rebuilding infrastructure when we rebuild infrastructure. So I think there's just like a lot of like project based stuff that has to be done. Um, and the cost of that is going to be passed off to this next generation. Um, if we don't kick, if we can kick the can, like we probably will, because that seems to be the human thing to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm just worried in terms of like how things are evolving, just like on the climate front. Like, I, I just, I, I don't think New York is supposed to flood that the way that it did. Like, I just don't think that's something that's meant to happen. I think that we can solve it, but like, we're going to have to apply technology. And I worry, like, to get back to the, the, the point I brought up first, I worry that technology will become potentially less accessible because of like all the shortages that we have and like these raw materials to and also like labor shortages to like build out these semiconductors and to really get things rolling on that front so that's i'm just like a little worried i'm not a bear i'm not a perma bear um i'm super optimistic on society but i, I do have like those core things that i worry about yeah so to me that's actually a really interesting observation and shri and i were talking about this he brought up an observation from mark dow who's on twitter and mm -hmm. and is a well-known macro account. commentator yeah. You know, Mark sees this, I think, very similarly to, to the way I do, which is sh supply tends to be pretty elastic, right? If you give it enough time, um, it tends to be pretty elastic. What causes the durable and runaway inflation is either where supply is in a position where it can't respond, right? Because uh, France has taken over Germany's, you know, production region, in industrial production region in the aftermath of World War I, um, or because the population growth is so rapid associated with the baby boomers. And this is, these are points that both Harley and I have raised from a demographic feature, you know, that it creates a continuous impulse on the demand side, that the supply side never really is able to catch up to. And the 1970s had, Shri has done a lot of work with me on this, on exactly this topic. You know, the 1970s had kind of the perfect storm where you simultaneously had an explosion in aggregate demand being driven by the baby boomers coming of age, deciding that they wanted, you know, uh, you know, uh, dishwashers and microwaves and apartments and everything else. And at the exact same time, we encountered the oil shocks that effectively shut off about a third of the productive capacity of the United States. Right. So that was a really, really unusual experience. The, the dynamic of cost push inflation that you're highlighting tends to be very temporary in nature. And, and I, I, I highlight that because the, the general narrative of the story in the 1970s is this cost push inflation. There's actually some fascinating research that was done in the late 1980s. It basically says, yeah, it didn't happen. And that's not what actually occurred, that it was largely demand pull. I think it was Meta who was the actual academic behind it. So when you think about the narrative that you're hearing, is it, is it the cost push? Because it doesn't feel like it's a demand pull story, it, or at least that's not the one that's being told. Um, yeah, I think so. But like, um, uh, that's, that seems to be like what I've noticed. I noticed, like, I think there's a lot of demand from coming out of the other side of one day COVID ending. But yep. I think that there's also like, just shortages across the board. Yeah, we definitely have seen have seen that. Um, Harley, when you ask the question, are you optimistic? Are you thinking about it from the standpoint of the general opportunity for this generation? Or are you thinking about it from the standpoint of, of politics? Or are you thinking about it from the standpoint of equity expectations? We were talking internally about uh, a, a competitor who put out some forecasts today for long-term equity expectations, particularly in the private markets that it's at least it's simplified. We were opening our eyes uh, pretty pretty wide to in terms of the forecasts. What, what, was, what was the direction that you were leaning? What, well, what were you focused on? about that, that, you know, when I was, you know, their age, you know, you could buy muni bonds that probably yield 8%. You could go in, and, and, and even though my first house had a mortgage of 10.5%, I could still afford that with a, I won't call it a starter job, but yeah, kind of like kind of like a, a, an ordinary somewhat starter job. And, and the stock market was trading at PEs that weren't crazy. So if you went and did your job and, 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 and kind of plotted along, kept your head down, you could invest and you could buy assets 
um, real estate or cars, whatever else it might be. And you could probably, you know, survive and keep up and advance yourself. Right now, you, you can't buy bonds. Um, I mean, at what, 1%, that, it, it doesn't matter if we're going up or down. I mean, there's, there's nothing there. Um, equities, I'd say, are interesting to the extent if, you, if you're picking a value portfolio, it pays dividends. Housing is insane. I, I mean, I, 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 my, uh, I have a daughter working at Google, earning a fancy salary, and it's unclear she could buy an apartment in New York. I mean, this is kind of crazy town. Um, and and I, I find this whole thing like the boomers have basically pulled forward all the value um, and given the bill to the millennials and, and below. Um, and and I, I, Kyle, I, I won't put you on the spot, but a little bit. So I'll, just, and I'll ask the question this way. Of your friends that you meet at the bar, how many of them voted in the last election? What percent? So that's actually an interesting question. Um, I have some, like it, it barbells. Um, so I have some friends that are like super politically active. Uh, and then I have some friends that are not, right? So it, like it's those two extremes. I would probably say like 60%. I mean, what's, I mean, Sri, I mean, I, I, I mean, you probably, I mean, I guess the Trumpies think you voted illegally, but whatever. Um, Shri, you know, Shri, Shri, Shri was able to vote in Chicago, yeah. but. <laughs> if you look at the, at, at the, at the, the last election, um, the let's call it the you know eighteen to twenty nine year old set, um, forty percent voted versus the millennial and older, uh, sorry, uh, uh, boomer and older was seventy percent, and in the non presidential, two thousand eighteen, two thousand fourteen, you had fifty five percent for boomers, and only twenty percent for the lower age group. And so I, 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 I when you, you basically, not only have the boomers already swept the land of all the valuable goods, but we're keeping it that way because we vote. But on the other hand, as much as you guys spend all your time tweeting and instinct and everything else, which I don't believe in, um, why don't you get your, get your goddamn butts and vote? I mean, that is how you change society. And if you have 20% voting and off your election, which is where the, the Congress, is, is created, not the presidency, which tends to be more important, where governors are elected, right, locally, and governors, all politics is local. I wonder, between the two of you, why don't you think your generation is voting? Um, I think there's like an element of past, I don't even want to say, like I, I've thought about this quite a bit because it is concerning and it's like kind of like an obvious answer. I think that they're like on the more negative end of the perspective, like there tends to be sort of like this passive outlook, like we can't change anything. So why would we try? Um, and then I think on like the more practical end, so like Kevin just dropped it in the chat. If we vote by a text message, that would change. Um, a lot of people like don't maybe like okay like maybe speaking a little too broadly but like just a generalization a lot of people don't want to go to like a voting booth um they just don't want to go uh so like i think there's also like an element i don't want to say that they're lazy but like there's sort of like those barriers that friction um and that can prevent people from doing something that doesn't and i think there's also like issues in general with um like long-term outlook with this generation like a lot of my friends that I talk to and like myself included uh, tend to think more in like the one to two year time frame versus like a 10 year time frame which I think is what most boomers tend to operate on so I think it's kind of like oh we just have to get through this we just have to keep on going so I think it's like those three things potentially yeah I mean I mean I mean clearly I mean, the way that the polls will go I mean Wisconsin or Arizona or Pennsylvania wouldn't have flipped if more younger people had voted but nonetheless, I'm sure there may be other red states where if the younger generation had voted, maybe like Kentucky, um, maybe West Virginia, that, that could have flipped over if you had, uh, if you took the, the voting percent. I, I guess it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm going off topic here. This, this, I don't believe that people should be allowed to complain if they're not going to vote. Um, as a matter of principle. Because um, that's how you go and change things. And it's, very, it's relatively easy to do, um, even if you're dead in Chicago. Yeah, it's, 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 it's it, I'm sorry, just to interject, because I, I, I wanted to hit on this, right? So when you think about that dynamic of voting, I mean, one of the things that strikes me as really surprising is the cynicism that the younger generation has relative to even my own generation, right? So Gen X was, you know, we were supposed to be the cynics. We were the ones that were supposed to say, you know, eh, none of it matters. You can't do anything. You can't accomplish it. Now, it turned out we were largely right. We were heavily ineffectual. And, and in a lot of ways, we, we have not had the opportunity. If Gavin Newsom is the best we can put out, that's a little disappointing. But when you think about that cynicism, 
it's certainly something that I encounter when I interact with the crypto universe, right? I mean, people react to me saying vote better and their response is, oh, of course, you know, well, you're, you know, you're a statist and you're sucking at the teat of, you know, the, uh, the, the traditional financial system. Of course, that's your, your conclusion. But, it, but it's, it's surprising to me that there is that lang- level of cynicism. Where do you think that's coming from? Because in, in, in all seriousness, like there are, there are problems, but relative to many of the things that I experienced growing up, ranging from, you know, everything from much worse crime. Harley brought this up in, a, in an earlier conversation, right? I mean, New York City has devolved into a disaster zone until you compare it to the Dinkins administration, right? Or the, the late 1980s and early 1990s. What's driving the cynicism in, in your analysis? Um, yeah, so Sri, I'll talk for a second and then you can weigh in. I, I think it's social media. So we see it all. Um, we see everything and that like and you know you can't escape it like all the time your phone is notifying you like oh yeah you know we fell in Afghanistan um like Russia is doing a weird thing again too and so it's just like constant bad news across like every domain that you're on and it's super hard to escape so I think that there's sort of this like um and even like the candidates that you know you have it's like well I don't really like that person but it's really hard to as a youth to run for office like I, um, one of my best friends helps people who want to be political candidates and who are younger, like trying to get into office, but oftentimes the older generation who are like the incumbents in the office make it very, very hard for anything to change, even if they do get into office. So it's kind of like this like feedback loop, right? Like, so you hear things that are bad, um, you get a little sad. And then if you try to like go in and act change, there's all these barriers to entry that still exist within the political system. And that can just be really disheartening. So I think it's like kind of like, that depressive cycle almost interesting and and if i look at your tiktok videos for the most part like there's a touch of cynicism to them right i mean it's definitely comedic but you you know i i would argue that brian undersold you right you've 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 built an incredible franchise doing something that candidly is not that hard in concept making fun of the traditional financial system and the people that you know go out and make various statements myself included and others right but you do it remarkably well are you tapping into that cynicism or are you more actually focused on when you're doing it are you thinking about the education are you thinking about the humor i know you're thinking about both but like what what's the driving force for you and what do you think people respond to most yeah i mean I think that there is like, I, I think I would say I'm probably a cynic with regards to the system. Um, I just don't think it's like the frameworks in place just don't make sense. Like, like not like the coin based case, like that's a whole different thing that the SEC needs to sort out. But like, you know, court case from 1946, like it just like, like it's sort of that stuff where like there's all these like mandates that are very, very old. Um, but when I make my TikToks, like um, most of the time it's just like, how can I explain this in a way that's accessible to people? And usually that's through the lens of humor. And my type of humor is just like sort of making fun of things um, so that it, it's never intentional. Like I do respect the Fed. I, I do respect the SEC. Um, but I think that, you know, in order to sort of enact change at that, that very local level, right? So to help people understand, to get people on board with like the system in general, um, you have to make fun of it almost and you have to point fingers. And then they'll be like, oh, like this is something that's like pretty accessible to me. She's making fun of it. It might make sense for me to like do more research about it. So it's kind of like more of an onboarding tool at that point for people, I would say. Shri, what's, what's your reaction? I mean, you, you are, as you pointed out, you're a, you know, a boomer in a zoomer's body, right? Um, do you think the cynicism is misplaced or do you think that there's, there's a legitimate need to make some truly dramatic changes that are unlikely to change as long as the current power structure is there. I mean, is that, what's your reaction to kind of what Kyla is leaning towards? So I would argue uh, sort of, so number one, uh, at least uh, at least from sort of say a voting or a political standpoint, uh, what I've noticed is at least most of my friends tend to be pretty politically active. So especially on Instagram or, or you know, Twitter or something like that, you know, they tend to, uh, you know, they tend to be very left leaning, uh, at least at least from what I've seen. But uh, but you know, leaving politics aside, where I say the cynicism comes from is number one, it's partly humorous. So you know, if you dunk on someone, you know, you find it, it, you know, it gets it gets a few laughs. But you know, the other thing is, um, I think that on Twitter it's easier to be cynical, uh, especially when you're anonymous. Uh, so you know, 
there's a bit of number one, no one's going to know who you are. And number two, you know, no one's, uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really mean much. Uh, it doesn't really mean much, you know, outside Twitter. So I think, I think that's sort of where you know, cynicism in general comes from. And at least for my generation, I would agree with what Kyla said. So there's sort of some amount of distrust in the political establishment, at least the way things are run right now. And, um, and, and you know, and I, I personally think there should be some amount of change done to fix it. But, um, but I think the changes that are being proposed by at least members of my generation, at least I personally tend to uh, disagree with them. So for example, giving 16 year olds to vote is at least in my opinion, not a very good idea. Um, number and uh, and uh, in general, I don't, I, I don't, I personally disagree with most of the policies that you know they support. But I think that you know, in order to say you know bring down housing prices, you know, you need to allow supply to rise, and it's just, I think it's just really hard to, I guess, convince people that you know the issue is that you know government is sort of implementing these zoning laws that. That, that, that reduced the supply of housing or like, you know, post 2008, you know, home builders have sort of had PTSD uh, in terms of building houses and they've, uh, and they've sort of built fewer houses uh, versus say, you know, someone becoming an Austrian economist and blaming the Fed or, you know, someone becoming sort of a left winger and then just blaming the capitalists uh, or the landlords and saying that, you know, it's just them becoming, uh, it's just them becoming richer, but I might just be rambling on here, but that's sort of, that's sort of my take on it. You, you, you actually bring up a really interesting point, Harley. I'm sorry, just give me, so the, the, the you brought up this issue of humor and we've talked broadly around this humor versus cynicism or nihilism, right? How much is the older generation just misinterpreting the cynicism and nihilism? I mean, when I interact with Kyla or I interact with Sri in, in an honest off social media framework, I don't detect that you guys are not hopeful or that you are, um, you know, so dissatisfied that it's borderline dysfunctional. Um, that could just be who I'm interacting with, but I'm, I'm wondering how much of the perception is just misinterpreting. Maybe to an extent. Um, but. So are, you, are you saying that the boomers are misinterpreting the zoomers? Yes. Are, are, are we treating your humor as nihilism? Maybe to an extent, yeah. But... Um, uh, I mean, there's, I guess there's sort of a difference between Zoomer humor and Boomer humor. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, I, I, I personally don't know, like, uh, well, uh, I guess Zoomers are sort of more exposed to, I guess, you know, general memes. So, you know, memes just making fun of all sorts of things and bringing that on Twitter versus, you know, Boomer actually not getting them because they're not as familiar with them. So I think that's, that might be part of it. And to an extent, you know, it's funny to, you know, you know, let's say, you know, user, you, let's say me, uh, you, uh, you know, write a post and says, you know, look, Bitcoin is bad. And you know, this is another reason why it's bad. And, you know, it's funny when they comment like, okay, boomer or something like that. So. Yeah. yeah that, that definitely has been part of my experience. Harley, I'm sorry. I cut you off. You were going to say. I'm just, I'm just wondering if, if this calling it, you know, you know, cynical snarkiness is really a, a quasi symptom of despair. And I say this in the sense of, you see the advance of, of, of a Bernie Sanders or an AOC, um, not personally, but this idea of quasi-socialism. And I wonder if what's really going on over here is because of the elevated housing prices, because of the cost of the massive debt to go to college um, and everything else associated with this is if, if all of a sudden our politics, and of course you know, government support going to the elderly as opposed to the young, um, that maybe it's just a matter of if, if, if my upside potential has been clipped by government and demographic policy, at the very least, they maybe have to go build a floor underneath me, and that's what's really going on. I think, that, and I think that's really what's being said here with this snarkiness. Um, and, and frankly, you know, if I didn't think I had the upside, I might as well have a floor on the downside, and, and, and that's not wrong. So it really is, it goes back to this question of, of optimism for the future about you know this whole about our whole society right now. I mean, so, you know, I, I do think that we're over allocating resources to the old. And, and, and I think the elderly, me included, I suppose, you know, maintain this, you know, grab of assets by voting more. Yeah, it's, oh. it, it, it's, it's an interesting question. So I, I'm going to um, redirect it to a couple of investment questions. So we talked about how you guys invest. You, um, Kyla, you mentioned that you engage in covered call strategies. Do either of you worry about a drawdown in the markets? Like, do you, do you hedge in any way, shape or form? 
No. Um, <laughs> no. That's what my that's what my waist stocks are for. <laughs> they're just too large. <laughs> um, yeah, no. Probably. Like that's why they're called diamond hands. Yeah, no, I know. So, so that that's actually to to me, this is one of the most fascinating things, and it's, you know, Harley, this is what you and I talk about on all the time. It's just that all the products that are built by, by far the most successful products at Simplify are the ones that offer downside protection, right? The idea that it is um, a, a need to protect an underlying asset base because of a limited earning capacity or income capacity to add to that um, is far and away the, the most in-demand products. And I, I think there's this fascinating dynamic of, of we build products for people that have money, not for people who are going to have money, right? And if you guys were to think about what you would want to invest in, right, what, what, what would the answer be? I mean, Kyla, I know you're thrilled about your target date fund, but if, if, if you could make a choice, right, what would that product look like? Would it be levered so that it has more volatility to it? Would it be um, a, would it have a crypto bent to it? Would it, you know, so it's e ESG or, or new economy or however you want to think about it. Yeah. Show me a well, picture. <laughs> there was a comment. I don't know if it was in the Q and A or in the chat, but somebody was like, do they like do Gen Z, do they do thematic investing? And I think that's a big thing. Um, um, yeah. So like investing in companies that you do care about, like, obviously, like, you know, there's some companies that you think are going to go up and you're investing in them. But I think like this generation for as much as like nihilism may exist, there's also an underlying desire to change the world. Right. Um, so I think that's like really big. It's just like, how do you put your money sort of where your passions are? And I think that's what crypto does well to a certain extent or what it's meant to do or designed to do. Um, and I think like ESG, ESG is like a whole different story. I, like that's always a little bit poorly structured in my opinion. But I think like if you can invest in products that you think are going to like really have an impact on society, that's that's the best place that you can be. Yeah. So when you when you think about that type of dynamic, because we've had a number of headlines that have come out in the past couple of weeks that are hitting on ESG in the way that you're saying it, right? It's it's kind of fake. There's no real you know control systems, etc. Do has that does that impact the ESG? You know the the cynicism effectively around ESG. Does it change an allocation mechanism, or do people kind of accept? Well, it's the best we can do right now. Uh, I mean, I think everybody knows it's sort of just like putting a tutu on a pig and you know calling it something pretty. But I I, I think like still people invest in it. Obviously, like it's still a very in demand product. But um, sorry, if you can hear the motorcycle, it's like that's all right. <laughs> Uh, somebody's just bracing up the street but um i think that like we, you know when you think about arc like those sorts of products are really appealing to my generation because it's like innovative right so it's like oh kathy woods for whatever you think about like how she does what she does and she's a whale in a lot of small biotechs she's still like thinking actively about like the future of investing so like whether that be space whether that be her fintech fund so i think it's like more of that kind of stuff like esg climate change that needs to manifest in a different way before it's appealing interesting Shri, from, from your perspective, what would what would coax you out of managing your own stock, you know, your own portfolio and picking stocks to a, an investor portfolio, right? A diversified fund portfolio, even just for diversification purposes. Yeah, I think you know what Simplify is doing is awesome, uh, especially on that path. So that's that's one thing. The other thing is I, I personally enjoy picking stocks. It's sort of an intellectual exercise where, uh, uh, you know, try, it's sort of a, it's almost like a game for me, you know, sitting down, spending all day reading and then trying to win a game and play, play it better than other people. So, so, uh, so, you, so you, you think about it as a game on effectively a board game that you're playing, that you're, you're, you know, gaining skills relative to the rest. It's less about the money at this point. To an extent, yeah. Uh, well, some of it is definitely for the money. I'm not no. gonna. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, yeah, and uh, and I guess ever since you know, I was a kid, I've always been into sort of these uh, these type of things. So I've 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 played a lot of chess and uh, you know, trying to try, and just in general, you know, intellectual exercises have pretty much been my thing or something that I that I like to do. And that's that's sort of why that's sort of part of why uh, I like to pick stocks. But you know, I think that you know, in, in terms of shifting to entirely say. Uh, you know, portfolio that consists of ETFs. You know, I think Simplify is sort of solving that solving that problem there because because um, you because know, number one, you're able to do better than the market uh, to an extent, and you're also sort of able to hedge the you know downside exposure and so on. And you know, the question that you asked at the start was, 
um, was, you know, if you're, uh, uh, if other offers actually worry about, you know, markets going down and, you know, the answer is yes. And, uh, and yeah. Um, and, you know, from, from also from say an ESG standpoint, um, uh, like personally, I'm sort of an ESG cynic. Um, I think you know, Harry Kupperman, uh, Harris Kupperman's stake that ESG stands for energy stops growing is a humorous and it's to an extent right as well. Uh, but I'm, I'm personally not a fan of ESG, but I noticed that most of my friends are. And, you know, that's, that's another thing that, that's another thing that, you know, the Zoomer generation is looking for uh, to, in, uh, to invest in, well, what, uh, you know, what are morally good companies, how will you define it and something that's actually doing good for, you know, for, uh, for the world, uh, as opposed to say, you know, an Exxon Mobil, which, you know, uh, which uh, drills oil and leads to, uh, and leads to say, you know, climate, uh, you know, climate changes and so on. And uh, yeah. So, all right. So, so let me, the, one of the things that, that popped up in an industry report that I read the other day that, that surprised me, and I, I'd love to react to hear your reaction to this which is that the younger generation is actually extremely interested in human interaction for advice. In other words, the RIA community, the registered investment advisor community, if they paid attention to the younger generation, the younger generation is, is interested in help in managing their investments. Kyla, what's your reaction to that? Yeah, I heard about this like a tiny little bit uh, that like the advisor generation is simply not prepared or the advisors are not prepared for the, the um, Gen Z generation. Um, I think that like there is the desire to like talk to people, but like not on the phone and maybe not even in person, like maybe through chat, um, like maybe through your Discord server. So I think there is that desire to like have people like guide you along the path. Um, but the way that advisors do it now, and even like the way that they structure the portfolios, like that's just not going to fly. It's going to be a lot more individualized. I think like people are really, they're not going to like be like, okay, 60, 40, like, cool, let's, let's go. Um, it's going to be more so like, oh, I, I want to be in this company. I want to do this sort of investing. And also like, I need to have room for my crypto allocation. Can you help me with that? And I think it's going to be more in like a text-based environment versus like the way that it is now. That's a fascinating idea, actually, a Discord-based RAA advisory service. I mean, it, it, it explains so much because I, I, I go on to, you know, either a Twitter spaces or I go on to a Discord channel where people are talking about crypto. And I, and I do actually actively try to seek out this information. It's astonishing to me um, how little validation, you know, like the blue check mark on Twitter is a joke because nobody cares about it, right? You know, the fact that your blue check mark is actually almost a, a negative badge to the younger generation, right? Um, but I see stuff, you know, being shared in these channels and I, you know, I'm, I'm horrified. I'm like, oh my God, that's not true, right? And, and it, you know, how do you guys think about managing the quality of the information that you receive? That's um, another tough one. There's like, uh, like uh, somebody wrote a piece about curators versus creators. And uh, like, we have so much information out there right now that you almost have to have like a designated curator, like yeah. sort of simplifying everything down um, for you. So I think like that going to be an increasing role. Like we always talk about the creator economy, but I think that there's going to be like this curator economy too, where you have people who are like organizing stuff, fact-checking things, because there is so much like disinformation, misinformation, especially on TikTok, where like people are like, buy this coin, it'll go up like a hundred thousand percent. So I think there is going to be like more services that are actually like gut checking and organizing information. And, but for right now, it's just like, you have to do signal versus noise, which is always hard. So when you think about that, that message, right? I mean, that's actually a really, it, it, you know, I see an ad that says this coin's going to go up a hundred thousand percent, right? Or a thousand percent or whatever. And my immediate, you know, BS detector goes off and says that guy's a scammer or that girl's a scammer, right? What is your generation? How does your generation react to that? Or, or why, why put that content out there, right? That, that is so obviously promotional. Is it effective? To an extent, yeah. Um, uh, so, at least on Instagram, there's a there's an account called uh, Baller Busters, which uh, which does exactly that. So it takes you know these fake traders or these fake you know gurus and sort of sort of exposes them. So in a way, I think partly number one is you see the you see at least over the last few years you've seen the rise of what I would call say like the coaching economy or the course selling economy. You know, everyone's selling these courses on you know forex trading or whatever it is, and uh, and 
and uh, I guess, uh, I guess to an extent, number one, it's been it's been very profitable at least for the scammers and the gurus who do it. But on the other hand, you know, it is the, it is definitely difficult to sort of navigate your way around uh, around number one, someone who has something to sell to you versus you know someone who's actually putting out good, genuine information. And in a way, you know, everyone has something to sell, but you know, someone who has like ulterior motives with their content versus someone who's actually putting out content to help people, it's it is definitely very difficult to uh, to sort of I guess sift through that uh, sift through those um, those kind of posts or those kind of accounts. That's, uh, I think that's actually probably a pretty good place for us to wrap up. We got, we got Brian coming in to give us the rug pull, to use the crypto <laughs> term. Um, I, I really appreciate you guys coming on and speaking so honestly about you know, the, the way that you see the financial world, the, the, the dynamics around investment. The thing that I'm taking away from this most is that there is, you know, I, I would basically say that Kyla paid for uh, pay, paid for everyone's hour long attendance with the observation about the curator economy versus the creator economy. It's a, it's a fascinating idea. I really, really love that way of thinking about it. I'm going to try to go away and think a little bit about how we can help in that framework, but it's a, it's a really interesting idea. Brian, I'm going to hand it over to you. So actually, I, I wanted to kind of try and end on a, on a positive note. And a number of the questions that we were getting kind of were really focused on the cynicism of you know the the kind of the intergenerational conflict, um, and and Mike, I thought you've done a couple of different um, podcasts where you really focused on reasons to be optimistic in the future. So, love to kind of hear from from each of you. You know, you know what can change? What are you optimistic about uh, about changing that kind of you know maybe puts a period on the on the cynicism and 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 creates a little bit of optimism for 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 Gen Z and millennials. Maybe maybe rephrase that just a little bit, like Kyla and and Shri. What would what would make you guys really optimistic, right? What 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 would break the cynicism? What what would you want to see? Um, That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just I think it'd be cool to see a little bit of a shakeup in in our politician makeup, uh, like who's running the country. Would be like maybe make them like a little not eighty five. Um, <laughs> that'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then and maybe maybe is, is it something around you know the, the rise of crypto and kind of these disruptive technologies and and maybe that enabling you know your generation and the millennials to have a little bit more of a say in financial markets and and the way that this the whole system is structured yeah I think yeah so. agreed yeah, yeah. yep mm-hmm. you know the, the thing that I would point out and I would just highlight this this is it, you know that actually is really encouraging to me, and I know people are sick of hearing my enthusiasm and, and excitement. But this this generation of political leaders is almost gone, right? I mean, there is only so much ossification that can actually happen. So you are going to get it. Um, the question is, what do you do with it when you get it? And that's going to be that. That I think we're going to have to leave for another day. But I, I, again, just wanted to say thank you so much. This was really a privilege. Um, and uh, I, I thank you to everyone who joined. And I, I can't get this curator economy thought out of my mind. All right, awesome. Well, well Shri, Kyla, thank you so much. Harley, uh, Mike, thank you. So thank next you. month, in honor of Cancer Awareness Month, we're going to have a, a really interesting conversation on healthcare investing with hedge fund investor Mike Taylor and Susan G. Komen Foundation. So. Um, tune in for that. We'll, we'll send a follow-up with the, with the replay to this, but um, thank you everyone for joining us. Have a great afternoon and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone.